My earlier research was on cognitive abilities and especially general cognitive ability intelligence. When I came to England, uh, I was able to uh, begin a large longitudinal twin study of about 15,000 pairs of twins from birth that's been funded by the Medical Research Council now for 20 years. We've studied cognitive development of these children, like their verbal ability, for example, their language ability, and behavior problems as well, in childhood. But then as they got to school, I was really keen on studying for the first time educational achievement, that is, how they do on school grades, and in England, the kids are tested a lot, so we have actual test performance on these kids for literacy, numeracy, the types of things that are taught in school. And I was interested in, is there heritable influence on educational achievement, not just cognitive abilities? But then what's the relationship between these? Are the kids who do well at school just the bright kids? Is it really just a reflection of the genetics of intelligence? So the first thing that we found when these kids got to first grade, they were born in 94, 95, and 96. So seven years later, we're studying them in their performance at school. It's a twin study comparing identical and non-identical twins. The twin method came up with a very surprising result, and that is even in the first year of life, at school, at seven years of age, the individual differences in the kids' performance at school on literacy tests, you know, like reading and numeracy tests, which basic arithmetic sort of things, was about 60% heritable. That is, the differences between the children and their performance were largely due to genetic differences, not to environmental differences. We used, one of the tests that was particularly interesting is our education minister at the time introduced a phonetics test where you have to sound out words that you haven't seen before, like D-E-G, DEG, you haven't seen that. The only way you can sound that out is phonetically. And he did that because he thought, well, it's just environmental. He wanted teachers to teach phonetics. So give all the kids, the seven-year-olds, 600,000 seven-year-olds, this phonetics test at seven so that he can see, are the teachers doing a good job? Turns out it's the most heritable test we have. 70% of the differences are due to genetics. You know, so by ignoring genetics, it, it really, um, makes a mess of anything you're trying to do. Teachers recognize genetics, although teacher textbooks, you won't find anything about genetics. So it's a bizarre situation. So the first finding that amazed me was that even in the first year of life, the individual differences in school performance were largely genetic. It stays that at that high level. We've now followed them through what we call GCSE exams at 16, which is the end of compulsory education. Everyone has to take the same test. Again, 65% heritable. Just as heritable for science, engineering, uh, um, the STEM subjects called science, technology, engineering, and math, the humanities subjects, they're all just about as heritable, substantially heritable. And then we followed them into what we call A-levels. You know, after compulsory education here, you go into two years of preparatory work for university, and then you go on to university. Again, just as heritable. And then I was interested in, well, is that just intelligence? Because there is a strong correlation about 0.5. A correlation just index is an index of similarity. So zero means not at all similar. One means 100% similar. So we're talking about 50% overlap in intelligence scores and educational achievement scores. What we find using genetics is that about 70% of the genetics that infects intelligence affects educational achievement. So a lot of what we're measuring as the genetics of educational achievement is the genetics of intelligence, but only about half or so. If this is 50%, another quarter can be explained by these other things we think about. Like currently, there's all this interest in grit, personality traits, you know, perseverance. You just gotta try harder and harder. And that's true, you know, you, you, you do have to try. But actually, at some point, it's smarter to give up because if you're not good at something and you try hard, you know, okay, it doesn't mean you won't do well, but it just means it's gonna take you a lot of time and effort to do that. And maybe there's something else that interests you more. So in terms of the overlap between intelligence and educational achievement, we find that there's quite a bit of genetic overlap, but it's not complete. If you found genes for intelligence, you could probably predict about half of the genetic variance for educational achievement, but that means about half of the genetics 
would be independent of intelligence. And part of that is mediated through personality sorts of things and other things that we don't know about yet. So I think that was um, still being absorbed by the educational community. I mean, th there is still not acceptance of the importance of genetics. And partly because people have, you know, crazy notions about what that means. You know, if it's genetic, I mean, some people say, well, then you can't do anything about it. It's obviously not true. I mean, there's strong heritable influence on reading. It doesn't mean that, you know, kids who have reading problems can't learn to read. It just means it's going to be harder to make them read. And it also suggests that you've got to recognize that kids are different. And some kids, you almost can't stop them from reading. I mean, they almost work out reading by themselves. But then most of the kids in the middle, they need help. But kids at the lower end, they're going to need a lot of help. And it depends on your values. And my values are more like the Finnish model, they call it, where um, you know, you could, your values could be right-wing. And you could say, well, if it's all genetic, let's just uh, teach the best and forget the rest. You know, because you'll get your most bang for your buck, they would think. I don't think that's stupid because so the intellectual capital of society doesn't involve just the handful of smartest people. If you invent these things, like the internet or whatever, you need a structure of a society that can do something with it. So you need uh, um, an educated population, not just a few brilliant people. But if your values are more left-wing, and you buy into, say, the Finnish model, they say, okay, kids are different genetically. What that means is some kids are going to take, uh, it's going to take a lot to get them to learn to read. Well, we will legislate a minimal level of literacy and numeracy, and we will spend whatever money it takes to get every kid up to that level. Because if you don't do that, then they're, they're disempowered, you know, in an increasingly technological society. They can't participate in society if they can't read decently, and if they can't do basic numeracy stuff. So the point that makes is that the knowledge is sort of independent of policy. Heritability doesn't dictate any policy. It depends on your values. But you'd think you'd make better decisions at the policy level with knowledge than without. And my frustration has been talking to politicians, I don't think they much care. They know what they want to do. And they'll look for evidence that sort of supports what they want to do. They don't want to deal with knowledge that, you know, isn't exactly what they want to know. But I think in the end it's going to be a big mistake. And I do believe education is going to have to take genetics seriously. And what will really make the difference is DNA. When the DNA revolution comes about and we begin to predict, um, not from twin and adoption studies, but from DNA alone, that's what's going to make the difference because parents are going to demand that something be done about it. So what do you do with this information? I think there's a lot of positive things that can come from it, but there are certainly things to worry about, like people worry about labeling, for example. But let's take the worst case scenario. So right now we can explain 10% of the variance of, say, educational achievement. And we can say, if, you, if your child's in the bottom of this genetic, right now, with this genetic polygenic score we have, they'll, they'll be one half as likely to go to university as kids at the top. Now, if you're like a university-educated parent, you just kind of assume your kids go to university. But if your kid's at the bottom of this polygenic score, which they could be, you know, the first law of genetics is like begets like. That means first-degree relatives are 50% similar genetically. The second law is like does not beget like. You're 50% different genetically. So that means within a family, uh, siblings will be very different. You'll find very different polygenic scores. So suppose the worst case scenario is you find out your kid, one of your kids, is in the bottom of this polygenic score. It means, it doesn't mean it's probabilistic. It doesn't mean they cannot go to university. It just does mean they're going to have a lot more difficulty going to university than your, your other child who's in the top of that genetic distribution. So it doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. But wouldn't it be good to know that? Wouldn't it be good to know that the one kid does well and you say, well done. The other kid doesn't do well. And you say, come on, now you've got to try harder, you know, if you only tried. If we only knew, it's harder. It's a lot harder. The kid deserves a lot of credit for doing what they do. And should they struggle to go to university? 
I mean, increasingly people are wondering, economically, is it a good thing? I mean, you know, spending all that time and in the UK, spending all that money, getting 40,000 pounds in debt. I mean, if a kid isn't inclined to that, and if they're, they know they're not particularly good at it, what is it, you know, is it right for you as a university educated parent just to say, forget it, you're going to university. It might be better to say, here are some things this kid likes to do, and maybe there's something alternative that they should do. But I want to emphasize, we're not saying it's hardwired and deterministic. It's strictly probabilistic. We're talking about a twofold, you know, you're, you're twofold less likely to go to university. Doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means it will be harder. And parents need to recognize that, I think. So it's just like the school example. Recognize that kids differ genetically, even within a family, and then to begin to respect those differences. And I think like education, parents ought to think of themselves more as resource managers. You give kids options to find out what they like to do and what they're good at. And you encourage them to do what they like to do and what they're good at, rather than your preconceived notions, which even include going to university, or if you're stupid enough to not recognize genetics and athletics, my kid is gonna be a marathon runner and win the gold medal in Olympics. You know, if you don't recognize the genetic differences, you're in for a world of hurt and, and unpleasant relationships with your kids because you've got these preordained views of what they ought to be. And the genetic message is, we don't mold kids. So what I mean is, for example, there's a new book out about parents as carpenters or gardeners. And the carpenter model is that we construct our children. We make them be what we want them to be, which is also the way people think about education, which is instruction. We have a national curriculum that we shove into kids' heads. That's instruction. But instead, the Gardner model is that you set up the environment to for the best opportunities for the child. You provide opportunities to see what they like to do and what they're good at. And in education as well, the, the operative word is education, which involves drawing out, educare, rather than instruction, which is shoving it in. It's the same idea that we draw kids out. We allow them to learn. We give them the opportunities to find out what they like to do and what they're good at. And so I think it suggests a, comp a different view of environments, including parents, what you can do as a parent, and also education, what teachers can do. And I think the basic message is that um, we need to provide the opportunity for children to kind of express their genetic propensities rather than shoving some preordained environments experiences on them. And I think it makes for a happier world too, because you know that uh, you're with your kids for a long time. And, and if you're thinking of this as a factory model, well, what you're doing as a parent is producing a good citizen, for example, then um, you, you're not gonna do that. I mean, your kid might do well, you might not. Most of the variance isn't in your control, it's genetic. But what you can do is have a good time and you can recognize the differences and kind of enjoy them. I mean, you know, it's the spice of life, they say. Individuality is the spice of life. So I think it is an important message for parents and teachers in terms of children, but it's also a message for us as well, you know, as individuals. Part of understanding ourselves is understanding genetics. And um, there's a neat uh, phrase by this famous uh, learning psychologist in the United States, Skinner, who developed the Skinner box, you know, for a completely controlled environment of infants. It, he believed everything was environmental, all that we are, is what we learn. He was the, the head of like the revolution in learning psychology in the 30s and 40s, which continued into the 70s. But as he grew up, he wrote a book on old age where he said, the older I get, the more I become who I am. And I can remember shaving my beard, looking in the mirror and saying, oh my God, I'm my father. And in a lot of ways, I've come to recognize that some of the things I don't like about myself, like getting angry easily, for example, it's just like my father, you know, in the same situations, in the same way. So it's part of understanding who we are, not to say, oh, well, nothing I can do about it, but actually to recognize I'm easily angered. So I'm, I could be into road rage. And so by recognizing that, I say, I've got to avoid those situations. I'm not going to let someone get me to the point where I'm going to lose it 
because I suffer from that. And, you know, and it could be dangerous as well, but it takes me a long time to get over it then once I get angry. So I try very hard to avoid that situation because I've seen it in my father and know how ugly it is and you know, not good for anybody. So that's an example where the, knowing the genetics is part of understanding who we are and it's not just to say, oh well, nothing I can do about it. To the contrary, it might actually be the way to do something about it.